Change is awkward. You have to think about it. You have to push yourself out of your comfort zone to get comfortable. But what we're talking about in this age of disruption that we're all living in is change. And that's a good place for us to start today. So change is inevitable and in business it's vital. And that's a backdrop, I think, for our discussion, whether we're talking about artificial intelligence, analytics, disruption in the insurance industry. This is what this is all about. Fresh ideas and fresh perspectives. So there's a lot that has been said about the future of work. The way we live, the way we work is changing. And talent is certainly a big part of that. How you attract talent, how you engage talent, how you recruit that talent, and then how do you, how do you keep them? How do you keep their hearts and their souls and their mind together? Because work has morphed, okay? It's no longer an eight to five proposition, okay? I know it's not in my organization, and I'm guessing it's not in yours, okay? People are working the way they want to live, okay? The way they want to work. And those organizations that are embracing these new paradigms are the organizations that are attracting the best and brightest talent out there. Those organizations that want to keep their heads buried in the sand and think, oh, this doesn't matter to me or to our organization, they are not going to be able to create the environment or to harness the talent that they need in today's workforce. So I'm going to bring a military acronym to all of you. Have you ever heard of VUCA? Any, any ex-military or reservists in the room? Okay. So my dad was Army, and he talked to this little girl in Chicago, and my sister and I, he would say, well, this is a VUCA environment, girls. What is that, Dad? What is VUCA? But it is a military term, but I think it really resonates with what we're dealing with today in today's landscape. It's volatile. It's uncertain. It's complex, and it's ambiguous. And to deal with a VUCA environment, you really do have to shift the way we have done business and look at fresh approaches. So now you know another military term. It's VUCA, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about VUCA. And maybe people won't call it VUCA, but you know Margaret did, and so did her dad. I'd like to, um, to bring you, you know, into kind of the mindset of what we're dealing with. Um, and here is the insurance reality, okay? We talked a little bit over lunch about the red, red, red hot war for talent. And it is hot. And it's crazy. It's insatiable, the demand for talent. Especially the demand for analytics and technology talent, actuarial talent. How many of you struggle, if you can be honest, um, to find the kind of talent you need in analytics, actuarial, AI? Okay. I see some hands. And you're not alone. You're not alone. It's tough. It's very, very tough out there. National unemployment is about 4%. Okay. It's very, very low. Insurance unemployment, I've never seen it this low. And I've been with Jacobson over 25 years. 1% unemployment in insurance. We have a fully, a fully employed workforce. Okay? People are happy, they're successful. You're fighting this ground war for talent. And I'm fighting it every day. And I can tell you, it's tough. Because the same talent you're looking for, 10 other companies easily are looking for the same talent. Okay? So this is the backdrop. This is our reality in insurance. And I think what we found, too, um, is that other um, industries are coming to insurance now to look for our talent. So we used to have a bubble around us, and people would say, oh, insurance. You know, they're, they're passe. You know, they're not state of the art. They're not cutting edge. And today, 
Now we have other industries coming to look for our talent. I think we'll talk certainly later about finding talent in other areas, but I love to find talent for my clients that is blended. Okay? Somebody coming out of another industry, out of manufacturing or hospitality, and who wants to transfer their skills over to the insurance space and have that ability for all of us to gain perspective from them. So there's a lot of fresh approaches that we can take as we're thinking about a way to deal with this war for talent. But this is real. This is red hot. Some people call it a bloody war for talent, uh, and they would be correct. So we're going to dig into a little bit about artificial intelligence. And I'm not an expert in AI. I think you know that. I'm an expert in executive search and staffing in the insurance industry. But what we, what we see today is this buzz that I talked about. Okay? People are worried. Are robots going to bring about the end of work? I mean, this isn't hype. This is reality. People talk about this. They worry about it. 72% okay? worry that robots and computers are going to take away jobs. And there are still 37% of people out there that identify as technophobes. Okay, so that source is Baylor University. Okay? We know that this is real. Okay, we know that there's question marks and there's fear. And some of it is hype, and some of it is just the fact that we need to educate and we need to evangelize and we need to bring people on board. So, we are living in this new reality today. Okay? We know that the workforce of today is really going to be a blended workforce, where we're going to have human beings side by side with robotics, working side by side, hand in hand, figuratively, um, to make a difference. And it's happening today. It is happening today. Is it happening in your organization? If you'd like to share, I'd be very interested or in any of your client groups because we know that in organizations today, um, one of my clients is specifically in the claims sector. Very, very far ahead, you know, in terms of claims processing, using AI, using cognitive, using robotics to process claims. And this is real. And this is real. And I think a lot of organizations, in fact, we say 50% are adapting cognitive and AI technology. So we know, we know that it's happening. Okay? My source there is Deloitte. I don't think we have anybody from Deloitte in the room. But we're, I think all of the firms are looking at this. The consulting firms are looking at it. Obviously, the staffing firms are looking at it. And we're all taking kind of that fresh look to say what's really happening. And I don't think any of you will be shocked by looking at this list. Receptionists, accountants, bookkeepers, financial analysts, telemarketers. Okay? And that's just the tip. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Okay? So, I'd like to do um, a little bit of market research whenever um, I'm, I'm doing a presentation like this. And I ask people what they think about robots. I ask people what they think about artificial intelligence, what it means to them. So I was talking to the gentleman at the hotel, and he said, well, Margaret, you know, in, in our Japan office, you know, in our Japan hotels, we don't have people welcoming you to the front desk and checking you in. It's all robotic. Okay? So the people at that hotel, and I was at the Intercontinental, he said, this is, this is what we do in Japan. He said, we have people on site, and they're really more welcoming their concierge, but they are not the people that are doing this. They're not checking your, your credit card or looking at your ID. That's all robotics. <coughs> and that's happening today. And I'm sure everybody saw the, uh, the word about Amazon last week with the grocery store, everybody picked that up. I mean, this is, this is happening. 
This is, this is real. And I think the fear, if I can you know, give you my interpretation, the fear is these people, they say, my role as I know it today might be going away. But our challenge is to talk to that accountant and say, you know what? The mundane tasks that you probably don't like to do anyway, having a machine take care of those will free you up to provide the kind of strategic insights that your clients or your company might desperately need that a machine can't do. So I think this is, this is where the education and the evangelizing comes in and kind of dispelling the fear and saying, if you had someone, a robot, next to you to do the things that you didn't want to do, to free you up, how much better could you be? There is a rise in demand for trainers, explainers, and sustainers. Okay? So trainers, I think that's self-explanatory. Okay? People who are going to train the workforce to work in this connected, augmented way. Okay? The explainers are the people that put it, um, you know, put those bridges out there, those bridges together. How how do we do it? And that human touch and that connection. And then the sustainers are those people that make sure that it actually works. And if there are bumps in the road, they are the people that serve as the facilitators, as the problem solvers, to make sure that the end game works. So these three top jobs, okay, they say that the demand for those jobs is going to be insatiable. So I wanted to be a little bit specific about automation technologies and what we're seeing in RPA, social robotics, and cognitive automation. And I think that I mentioned claims. Um, claims is where we're seeing a lot of activity in robotics right now, um, claims processing, because it's high volume, it's low complexity and routine. Now, obviously, um, complex commercial claims are not in this category. But we're talking about claims that can be easily processed, that there's not going to be any mistake in you know, paying it or not paying it. Okay? And we're seeing this happen today. And then cognitive, um, AI and machine learning, again, where we're seeing it most right now is in claims. Um, I have not um, seen with my clients yet a lot in underwriting, though I know that it's starting, and I know that a lot of my underwriting clients are looking for AI in the people and that background. They're looking for that right now. Um, I know in the analytics space, I know a lot of my clients are saying, we must have someone okay, to come into our organization who understands automation technology. Okay? So it's almost becoming um, table stakes a year ago. That would have been a nice to have. Now, I think what we're seeing, my clients are saying, we need to have this person. Okay? And no one right now is an expert. You know, anybody who tells me I know everything about this, I'll tell you, I'm not going to believe them. Okay? But if they say, you know what, I'm on the learning curve, I'm out there, I'm hungry, I'm creating communities, I'm getting ideas, I'm networking, I'm sitting in conferences like this, I'm doing some research, those are the kind of people that we want. Because they are continuous learners. They are the people that are going to survive in the VUCA environment. So I think this is just a, a really small snapshot, courtesy of Willis Towers Watson, on what's happening today in insurance. So I wanted to focus on what I call the big three um, in terms of AI and what we're seeing um, in insurance right now. And that is customer experience and coverage personalization, claims settlement, and behavioral pricing. 
We know, um, and a lot of this is very PNC centric right now. We haven't seen as much, I haven't, in the healthcare space or in the um, in the life space yet. Okay? So, um, you know, my focus is all insurance, everything. But I think what we're seeing right now is very, very PNC centric. I don't know if you would agree. I see a couple of heads nodding. This is where um, this is where this activity is, and I think customer experience. Um, it's a red hot topic, you know, and personalizing the experience. And you know, we all have heard about you know kind of uh, the journey maps that go on in organization and what's going on in marketing analytics and the need for um, this personalization. And we'll talk about this dichotomy that we're facing right now because it, it seems like the world has a need to have this personal touch and this human touch. And then there's the other side with the machines and AI and how are we balancing that out. And there is a lot of talk about how are we going to bridge? How are we going to bridge these two worlds that we're living in simultaneously? So we started to talk about this automation versus humanization. And there's an organization called Trend Watching. And I like to watch um, their, their white papers. They do some neat videos um, as well, Trend Watching, you'll see. And it's that. It's that argument, right? Fast, easy, frictionless versus interaction and experience, social and intimate. Okay? How can we live in both worlds? And I think we could uh, spend our afternoon debating that or we can just watch it unfold. I think what we've been hearing is there has to be, there has to be a place for both. Because humans do crave this. You know, that's my opinion. That's not, you know, that's not a fact. But when you, if you take a look at trend watch, um, trend watching, I should say, there is, um, there's a rise in that human need to have that personal connect. So what I read, and I couldn't find the stat on it, but maybe one of you had read the stories. There were, um, there was a list of the new, kind of new craziest jobs that were being created. And one of them is called a talker. Okay? So a talker is hired by a person to talk to them. So if I'm, let's say I'm an elderly woman, and I want somebody just to talk with me, you know, to have conversation, sit down, have a little chat, I hire a talker. And this talker will come and sit with me, take a walk with me, and that person, that's a job. That's a talker. And you know what, we're gonna hear about more and more roles like that being created. And you know what, for somebody, I mean, who would have ever thought, I mean, years ago, people thought, oh, would you pay somebody to, to walk your dog? Well, how many of you have ever had a dog walker? I have, you know? And that's a, that's a, a major, it, it's great. You know, for those people, it's great for us who love animals but need to have their animal taken care of during the day. The same thing with the talker. I could see, you know, my mom needs a talker. She, you know, I'm her talker right now. You know, my sister is. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. So we're going to see a lot of evolution. Um, I just thought this was interesting um, as, a, as a backdrop and as a data point. Let's move into how do we manage in an augmented workforce. So today, we know that we are moving into a blended workplace. So 11% of organizations are prepared to manage a blended workforce. And we know those organizations are taking a people-first approach to AI. So they're trying to take away the fear factor. They're trying to say people come first. And AI is an augmentation. It's a tool. It's not a way for us to eliminate our workforce, but it's a way for us to, to expand it, to enrich it, to rise up and to lift up an organization. This is a 
Deloitte study, and this isn't just insurance, this is across the board. But based on this number, we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go. And again, if any of you can pull any specific insurance data, that's probably our challenge, you know, to be able to pull some specifics for the insurance industry about where we stand. So we're really um, focused on looking at AI as an enabler, okay? a way for higher productivity, increased efficiencies, convenience and creating kind of a harmony of AI and people working side by side and in hand. Okay? So that's the goal. Okay? That's the goal if we can get there. And I think we have a ways to go in terms of that education and that understanding. But that's really the end game that we'd like to get to as we think about the augmented workforce. I think the other thing about the augmented workforce that I want to bring up is that you know, the workforce of today isn't going to just be full-time workers. Okay? It's going to be contract workers, you know, consultants, people who work and live you know, the way they want to. So they may be the gig worker. Okay? Many of you have heard that. Many of you have gig workers on your teams right now. They'll come in and do a six-week or an eight-week or a three-month gig, and then they'll go off and they might go mountain climbing, or they may just take some time off to be with their family, and then they'll come back to work when they want to work, or when an engagement attracts them. Okay? So this blended workforce is permanent workers, gig workers, AI, robotics, all working together in this new reality that we've created. Okay, so what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> How do we attract talent with artificial intelligence? The only way we're going to get talent in okay, is to be fresh and provocative. Okay? So we have to pull in millennial talent, we have to pull in Generation Z, and we have to get the career changers. We have to get people to take a second look, or a first look, at insurance. People from other industries. And we can do that in analytics, we can do that in technology, okay, easily. Okay, it's tougher in actuarial, it's tougher in claims, it's tougher in underwriting. But in the space where you can do it, what we're talking about, this is a great way for us to start to replenish the talent pool. And the other thing we didn't talk about is that insurance has the most aged workforce in corporate America. Okay? So if some stats for you, the average age of an underwriter is 58 years old. The average age of a claims professional is 59 years old. I don't even want to tell you the average age of an agent. It's like in the 60s. Okay, and so we know that there is this huge exodus of talent that's coming. We also know there's a huge talent gap. Okay, the number that we are quoting is 400,000 jobs are going to need to be filled by 2020. And we don't know where that talent is coming from. It's only about 10% is going to be coming from colleges and universities. But I think it's a rebranding opportunity for the industry. 